We're exploring the world of the sports docuseries with a producer at Omaha Productions, which is about to release a series on Caitlin Clark, Camila Cardoso, and Kiki Rice. Plus, the WNBA is finally getting charter flights, and one of the major baseball development hubs is facing scrutiny for exploiting players' earning power. It's Thursday, May 9th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. As the WNBA grows in popularity and revenue, there are a few issues that players want to see addressed. And this week, the league finally met one of their big asks, charter flights. The league announced that it is committing $50 million over the next two years to chartering flights for players every time they travel. Players responded by saying that it's about time and that this is a safety issue. Regularly traveling through public airports exposed them in ways that many players weren't comfortable with, and that issue is only going to become more prominent with Caitlin Clark's arrival and the WNBA having more games on national television. There's a reason that you never see Nikola Jokic at Denver International or Jalen Brunson at JFK on their way to the next game. Players still want additional roster spots and better pay, but charter flights are an obvious place to start. The issue touches on both quality of life and safety. It's a fixed cost, and with a new media deal on the horizon, it's one that the league can afford. Perfect Game is the central hub for amateur baseball showcases and tournaments. For players who are trying to get noticed by scouts, there are few better ways to do it than to throw down thousands of dollars to participate in Perfect Game events. Mike Trout, Bryce Harper, Mookie Betts, and Freddie Freeman are just a few of the over 2,000 Perfect Game alumni who have appeared in a Major League Baseball game and 14,000 who have been drafted. But now, Perfect Game is drawing a lot of concern from agents for how they are attempting to monetize their treasure trove of future MLB talent. Perfect Game and Fanatics are reportedly closing in on a deal that would allow Fanatics to produce trading cards of Perfect Game players. That's undoubtedly a tantalizing source of IP for Fanatics because it would eventually give them a supply of older cards of current stars before they became famous. However, Perfect Game doesn't automatically own players' on IL rights. They get it through a contract that players sign prior to participating in Perfect Game events that grants the organization NIL rights in perpetuity. One agent that The Athletic spoke to said that this is borderline illegal and that parents should file a class action lawsuit against Perfect Game. With college athletes showing the power that NIL rights can bring, this fight could be just getting started. All right, very excited to be joined now by Therese Andrews, head of production at Omaha Productions. Welcome, Therese. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yeah, great to have you on. So uh, first, before we get into your, your most recent work, I want to get in, uh, learn a little bit about your role. Um, what are your main responsibilities at, at Omaha? Sure. So I oversee production, which is across our commercial, unscripted, and all of the things that we make in between. So my uh, my my role at Omaha is basically managing all of our shows in an ongoing capacity to make sure that they're up and running. But uh, depending on the project, I take a much deeper role, which includes Full Court Press, the docu series that is up is upcoming launch this weekend. Yeah, yeah, very exciting. And at any given moment, how many irons do you have on the fire usually in terms of like shows in progress? Uh, Omaha is a busy place. So uh, I guess, um, gosh, uh, hard to answer specifically, probably, I don't know, somewhere between like eight and 12 active projects, whether they're in pre-production or in active production on a given day. Yeah, so so we're we're very busy at Omaha. Yeah, and getting to Full Court Press, the docu series coming out coming out this weekend. Uh, so it focuses on Caitlin Clark, Camila Cardoso, and Kiki Rice. I imagine there had to be some temptation just to focus on Clark, given that you know she's she's one of the most prominent athletes in, in the country right now. Why go with all three? Well, you know, when we were early in development, we, of course, went back and forth a little bit on what is the best series that would show the extensive nature of women's college basketball. And though Caitlin is obviously a good vantage point into that, it it felt really important for us to make sure that we were really balancing different characters and understanding their archetypes and and their vantage point into, into the sport. So Caitlin is obviously like a really impressive like corner milestone of, of the series, but without Kiki and Camilla, we wouldn't really have the depth of character and really understanding of the sport in its full complexity. So, uh, you know, when, when we went back and forth in development, it felt really important to make sure that we were doing that properly. 
Yeah, I mean, it really just depends on what kind of story you're trying to tell. And if you're trying to tell the story of the NBA and you said, okay, well, let's let's just tell this through the eyes of LeBron James, like you wouldn't, <laughs> you would get a story, you get a good story, but you wouldn't get a story about the NBA. You get a story about one very singular person. Um, so yeah, if it's a more comprehensive thing, it makes sense to, you know, get, get multiple perspectives to get more of the full picture. Um, um, on the Caitlin piece of this, because she's been receiving so much national attention for months now, um, the audience already knows a lot about her. How did that shape where you put your focus in telling her story? Well, uh, I mean, honestly, the, this show was a wild ride in pre-production of figuring out how many days do we need to cover? The season is long. How important is the regular season? How important is March Madness? So it was... Uh, a complex strategy session to really think through how to how to approach all three of them. Um, so early on in development, and Kristen Lapis, our, our director, who's uh, absolutely wonderful and such a superstar, and we spent a lot of time working through with her the story angles that we wanted to approach and how many days and what type of access. And then very quickly, we got into like a quick strategy plan with the larger words and pictures team. Uh, that felt appropriate and comprehensive with enough days to make sure that we were truly covering the story from every angle that we needed to. Uh, and uh, I feel like when when we looked in the edit room, of course, we had many hours of footage to kind of slog over, but we, we eventually got to a story that really took a lot of shape very easily, and it, it couldn't have been done without really good core producers on the ground and also the participation of the schools to make sure that that was possible. So, um, yeah, it... A longer answer to say it was not easy, but uh, when you get the right people focusing on the same goal, like it, it just starts clicking into place really, really actively and very quickly. How, how, to what degree did you end up in a place you sort of expected? I would say with 75% confidence, we kind of forecasted it, um, is the most specific answer I can give. I mean, it's impossible to know how their seasons are going to turn out. And it's also impossible to know, of course, with the magic of March Madness, like, how is the tournament going to play? So I think part of, honestly, the biggest challenge wasn't necessarily in filming, but it was in editing, you know, because we were trying to figure out the scope of these episodes while the season was in progress, including, you know, you, I talked to you now, early May, like our, our season just ended, uh, you know, and really by the time the season ended, we needed episodes one and two to be truly locked. Three was partially locked and four was kind of up in the air. So we were figuring out, how the content time really needed to be managed as we were hoping that the athletes would have a really successful run in the tournament, which uh, thankfully, you know, we, we picked superstars in the beginning and we felt really strong about them and it paid off in a big way. But anybody who's a college basketball fan knows that you can never guarantee on how the season is going to end. So uh, I, I feel like our confidence paid off in the right way. Uh, and, you know, I, I think, we took a gamble and a risk uh, in the edit room as we were going and it, and it paid off really well. So um, yeah, it, it, like we couldn't be prouder of where we stand today just based on some of those challenges. It was, it was a remarkable feat for the full team. And I mean, like the many people that are really like still now working like 24 seven around the clock to like make sure that we're, we're delivering in time. Yeah, I mean, it's got to be harrowing doing a docu-series about March Madness because literally any game. I mean, I remember hearing people say like, uh-oh, like they gave Caitlin a really hard schedule. Like she might be out in the second round. Um, so, um, so yeah, fortunately for you, she made it through the finals. Um, and just on, on her, her character, I want to get to Camilla and Kiki too, but uh, just one more on Caitlin. Um, I feel like she's got her sort of like super fiery on-court persona where, you know, she's talking trash and getting super amped up and then there's sort of her with the media which is uh you know very you know like friendly to the media and you know very giving to her teammates and just you know focused on on the game and um and sort of almost speaks from the perspective of her team instead of herself um I'm wondering I, there has to be a third side to her <laughs> that is that is neither of those things uh because those are two very specific contexts and I'm wondering if you can speak to sort of what you learned, what the audience will learn about her um, that we're not getting from all this attention, but, you know, in a sort of very narrow scope. Sure. I mean, I, I think with any character like this that's in the spotlight um, and for her under the immense pressure that she was in this season, I think it was it was really powerful for us to be there in some of the more vulnerable, quiet moments. You know, and obviously we're there in 
while she's with her family, with her boyfriend, like her family is just so core and critical to who she is as a person and also kind of defines her as an individual and how she carries her life. So there were, there's a lot of family moments that really pop off the screen. Um, I think there's also kind of that, like, the, the quiet few steps removed from the spotlight for any character really like helps you understand who they are on a deeper level. And you see that with Caitlin, I think in a way that's really relatable and um, separately, I mean, you hit it a little bit and just talking about what you see with her on the court, she's always like a step ahead, right? Like she, she thinks about the game, unlike how many others are able to approach it. And you can see that a little bit in her personal life that she's somebody that feels like she has a really strong sense of self and awareness. And she did from when she was a little girl of who she wanted to be and what she wanted to do. And I, I think in that way, she's a really like, like wonderful role model, not just for women, but for people. Like, and I think this is also a story of young athletes that are, that are juggling a lot in order to figure out kind of how, how they want to be who they want to be. Um, so you see a little bit of that while they're also uh, really navigating their season and focusing on, on, like you said, the team atmosphere. So I think Caitlin specifically, that was something that I found like really like humbling and powerful with, with her story um, that uh, to be able to get to know her in that light was, was amazing. And with Camilla and Kiki, um, you, you spoke to how they kind of provide a more fuller picture of, of women's college basketball. Um, and, you know, Camille is the third overall pick. Kiki's a you know, star at UCLA. What kind of, um, uh, how do they fill out this picture for us? Sure. Well, Camilla's story, uh, you know, has international scope. I, I think there's, there's aspects to her story that I feel like are, are probably going to be the most surprising to people. You look at Caitlin and in some way, like, people know more about who she is and the impact that she's had in the game. Uh, of course, they're going to get new perspective to that when they watch the docu-series where Camilla, a lot of people are really learning about her for the first time. Um, I, I think there's that international component of her story and what basketball has provided to her and her family is, is really powerful. And Kiki comes from, um, you know, a, a really successful family herself. And I think there's, there's a little bit of, uh, you know, her trying to figure out how how to measure up to that and kind of like how to stand independently. Uh, while also, I mean, the UCLA team just has like such a fun dynamic and, and looking at Kiki as a sophomore within within the story, I think she also offers a little bit more of a unique vantage point to, to Kiki and Camilla that way as well. In a, in a growing young team that that is also obviously incredibly successful. This docuseries, from the way you're describing it, seems to, you know, get a little more personal, a little more uh, maybe heartfelt or just kind of, you know, seeing people in these these more tender moments. Um, you know, would you say this is something that's um, sort of um, uh, not exactly new territory, but different from from the normal tone of what you usually do? Well, I would I would compare it to an extension of the quarterback series. I, I think when we launched that franchise in a way, also it helped people to see sort of beyond the position. Uh, so that's what full course full court press is intended to do. That it isn't necessarily just about the on the court experience. It's about the off the court experience and the access. So uh, for us, very similar in vain with that, and also. I think Omaha in general, like part of our intention is to make sure that we're we're telling stories that really capture the competitive nature of sport and some of some of the best competitors in the game. So uh, though it isn't necessarily reflective of everything that's in our portfolio, it is reflective of a few core examples and, and also other things that are on our slate, hopefully to come. Uh, so yeah, it, it feels very na natural, and especially for Peyton um, a, as such a remarkable competitor himself uh, back in his day. And now as he's really focusing on the best athlete stories for Omaha to really help with facilitating. Yeah, and that starts to answer my next question, which is just, um, you know, sports docu series are becoming, you know, more and more part of the the sports media world. And where do you guys see your your place in that? You know, as one of the main producers of the, you know, focused on this kind of content. Well, hopefully, uh, it's an active part of the storytelling that we continue to make. I, I think, you know, Peyton 
specifically, like really wants to be attached to projects that make sense for him and an extension of his brand. And I think when people watch Full Court Press, they'll understand part of why like Peyton individually finds this really compelling and also why Omaha like really cared to help with facilitating like this. I, I think there's a transcendent nature a little bit with this show and not to oversell it, but like this story like this hasn't been told really about women's sports in general. And also like it, it's the first time that we're able to view it in, in college basketball in this way. So I think we want to continue to be part of that conversation and figure out how to do things new and different and fresh. And uh, of course that relates to, to our intentions with docu-series as well, uh, that we wanna tell stories that not just people want to see, but really make sense for Omaha to be attached to and help with facilitating. All right. Well, looking forward to checking it out. Teresa Andrews, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Thank you. I appreciate it very much. That's it for today. Subscribe, tell a friend about the show, and check us out on YouTube. We're now putting all our episodes, including the Flavor Flavor interview, which is greatly enhanced by the visual. Just search for Front Office Sports today and hit subscribe once you're there. Thanks for listening. We will see you tomorrow.